Good afternoon, everybody. I think it's uh, 4 p.m. So we'd like to propose that we immediately start. So um, I would like to welcome everybody to this interesting webinar hosted by Kay Leuven and Agrono in the context of the Big Data uh, Grips project. My name is uh, Robin Krohn and I will be moderating this webinar. And I will give a bit more information before we start with the uh, interesting speakers of today. And as you can see on the title slide uh, shared today, this webinar will be about predictive analytics for food risk prevention, with a special focus on how to design both visually appealing and interactive predictions. Before we start the webinar, I would like to give you some hints on how you can get the most out of this online session. First, feel free to take notes. At the end of the talks, we will have approximately 30 minutes for Q&A. We would therefore like to ask you to use the live chat function here in Zoom to ask your questions. We as the organizers will try to bundle these questions and organize the Q&A afterwards. Finally, I would also like to ask all members of the audience to please turn off your camera and microphone. Then I'm happy to introduce the five interesting speakers we invited for you today. First, we have Professor Katrien Verbert, who is an associate professor at KU Leuven and also the head of our research group. Second, we have Dr. Nikos Monoselis, who is the CT CEO and co-founder of Agrono. Then, we have Dr. Janis Stoitsis, who is the CEO and also a partner at Agrono. Then it is followed by Dr. Nini Tun, who is a postdoc at the research group. And then finally, we also have Michalis Papa Constantino, the data services lead at Agrono. I also want to ask every speaker to introduce themselves in approximately one minute at the start of their talk. Before we finally jump into the talks, I would like to briefly go over the agenda with you. Uh, first, Nikos and Katrin will go over the challenges, both from a business and academics perspective. Then Janis will guide us through on how to translate these business questions to a risk dashboard. Nini will go over the design guidelines on how to make such a dashboard visually appealing. And then finally, Michalis will show us the Food Archive Food Risk Prediction Dashboard uh, that was developed uh, in this project. We estimate that these talks will take approximately one hour in total, and then we have 30 minutes left for the Q&A at the end. So don't forget to post uh, questions in the chat as soon as you can think of them. So enough of me, I would now like to ask Dr. Monoselis to please introduce uh, himself and talk about the questions from the food industry about uh, predictive analytics. Thank you, Robin. Thank you everyone for joining us. I am uh, Nikos, I'm uh, the CEO of Agrono, uh, but I'm so much uh, pleased and happy that uh, we are organizing this uh, together, Agrono together with KU11. Our working relationship with uh, KU11 goes back in the years before Agrono, uh, back in my PhD student times. Um, we, we started working with uh, the team uh, that Katrin was a, a member of back then of uh, on topics that had to do with how do we collect data and metadata, data about data, from uh, a variety of sources in different formats. And how can we combine them to build a way to discover useful information? Uh, it was, I think, over many years ago, I will not say how many exactly. And uh, part of the legacy uh, that got our company where it is right now is coming from uh, research uh, work that uh, the team at KU11 has been doing. So I'm very thankful as well uh, for having the opportunity to present this together with you guys. My intro will be about uh, the business challenges and uh, the business challenges and the business interest that the food industry sees in uh, this technology, AI and in particular the prediction part. How can we use algorithms to calculate meaningful predictions? So if we, we go to what the industry says, literally says, one of the colleagues that is leading uh, the predictive modeling and analytics uh, project with one, one of the largest food manufacturers in the world said, okay, there are so many solutions out there or so-called solutions 
everyone that is working in a company like yours is coming and saying, we have the, the greatest solution of all times. But I think that in most cases, there are solutions to a problem that is not defined yet. So that's why I find it very important to focus on the definition of the problem. And as part of this exploration, this journey to define very well the problem and the questions that we have to respond to, we set up an interest group that gets together people from uh, the food supply chain, people working at food manufacturers, retailers, in different companies that are either very much interested in using or would be interested to use this kind of technologies. This is a collaboration that includes uh, teams, more teams uh, like the team of uh, Queen's University and uh, Professor Chris Elliott, uh, food thread testing uh, people uh, and uh, data modeling and analytics people. And we already have 25 companies uh, represented in this interest group. And before joining, we asked three questions. One of those is, what is your experience with predictive analytics? The second was, how much money would you pay for such a solution? And the third one, I will save it for another webinar. What did they say? What is your experience with predictive analytics? The majority of them said, I know the technology, I've heard a lot about the technology or I've read a lot of, about the technology, but I haven't tried it yet. So it's a buzzword that I hear a lot, but I don't know how it looks like or what is it for? And how much money would you pay? Most of them said, not more than 20,000 per year in the range of 10 and 20,000. This gives a little bit about the starting point when we start talking about this technology to our audience, to our users, as well as the potential investment that they're willing to make. And if we see a discrepancy there, it's this connection, this challenge between what is the value that we can provide that will justify this investment and maybe justified a higher investment in such a technology. And I leave it here on the table for everyone to consider. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nikos. Um... I would like to know, uh, give the floor to uh, Catherine, uh, if you could also please introduce yourself a bit and then uh, we're happy to listen to your talk as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, just to briefly introduce myself in a bit more detail, I am an associate professor at KU Leuven at the computer science department uh, where we work in the human computer interaction group. Uh, so most of our research is focused um, on, on human computer interaction issues. Um, and so we focus a lot on, for instance, explainable AI, also visual analytics, um, where we try to research how we can increase the adoption of predictive analytics of, of machine learning models for end users. And so not only expert users, but also non-expert users. So users with little or no knowledge in machine learning, um, which of course poses additional UX uh, challenges. Can go to the next slide, uh, Robin. A first key challenge here that we try to address is uncertainty. Uncertainty is present in almost all data. And of course, this uncertainty also propagates when data is transformed. Uh, and then when data is used in models, additional uncertainty is added on top of that. And so part of the research that we do is to visualize that uncertainty, uh, uncertainty in the data, but also uncertainty in models. Uh, to support awareness of this uncertainty for end users. Uh, that's a big research line in our group. Secondly, we also research how we can enable end users to interact with models. With interaction with models, the key goal is that um, users, first of all, um, can understand the rationale of models, uh, but also 
Um, this has been shown to play a key role in trust building when users then uh, use machine learning models. Secondly, we also research how we can then use user interaction to incorporate feedback of end users. What we sometimes see is that machine learning models not, not, sometimes don't have a very high accuracy, and that by incorporating domain knowledge of end users, we can increase uh, the accuracy of a model. Then Robin, can you go to the next slide? Model explanations are of course uh, crucial here. So users need to understand uh, the behavior of a model if they want to incorporate feedback. Um, but of course, very recent models, also deep learning networks uh, are often very, very complex. And so they're often way too complex to explain uh, to end users, also definitely non-expert users. Uh, so most of the work that we do here is um, using model agnostic techniques. Uh, for instance, uh, using approximations, um, simpler models that can approximate the more complex model that we then try to explain to an end user. Um, other approaches are, um, for instance, uh, using techniques like example-based methods. Nini will uh, show some examples uh, later in this presentation, like Lime, like you have also Shapley values that then try to, for instance, give insight into which features uh, are important in a model and what are particular value spaces. Now, what we see is there have been a wide range of uh, explanation methods that have been proposed in the literature. But there's actually very little work on evaluating with end users whether this actually improves uh, the model understanding, whether they can interpret an actual model. So a lot of our work is then focused on evaluating with end users in real applications, uh, whether end users then indeed understand models and whether this increases their trust. Now what we see in these user studies is that there's a lot of differences. Um, Users are very, very different. Uh, and then depending on the technical knowledge that they have, also depending on their domain expertise, the effectiveness of user interfaces on top of predictive models is very, very different. So in most of the research projects that we do, uh, we employ user-centered design methodologies uh, where we involve end users into the design of a user interface. For instance, starting with focus groups, co-design sessions, then elaborating low fidelity prototypes, uh, and then evaluating these with end users so that in the end we come up with designs that are tailored to the needs of the actual end users of the applications. And with that, I would like to wrap up my short introduction on challenges, uh, but Nini, as I mentioned, will a bit later in this presentation show some very concrete examples of the work that we've been uh, doing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And indeed, before we go to uh, Nini, I would first like to give the floor to uh, Janis. Uh, we will also introduce himself uh, first and talk about how to translate all this business side towards a dis risk uh, dashboard. So, Janis, so, love it yours. Thank you very much, Robby. Thank you very much for inviting me for this presentation. Um, my name is Janis Stoitis. I am the CTO in Agronol, uh, and I'm also a partner, a partner in Agronol. Uh, my passion is uh, in working uh, with uh, data in the food industry and in providing solutions to the uh, critical business questions that the experts in the food industry have. Uh, and this is what I will be talking today here, following a very interesting intro by Nikos, by, but also the challenges that we face when we are developing uh, a risk dashboard uh, that uh, Catherine mentioned. So I will speak of how we can move from a business question to a live risk dashboard that can help the experts working in the food industry to take critical uh, decisions. Next slide, please. So I think that we will all agree that everything starts with a business question. And when it comes to artificial intelligence, there is no single answer to the question of which is the best strategy or which are the best AI tools that you can use to answer a business question. And this is because applying artificial intelligence and developing prediction models it's not about uh, just using some tools that are available. 
but uh, it involves trade-offs such as more speed, less accuracy, more data, less privacy, more autonomy, less control. So there, there are many critical uh, trade-offs that uh, you need to study. Our method to address the critical business question consists in something that we call the food safety intelligence equation. This equation has one part that has to do with the data uh, that we need to use, a part that has to do with the methods that we can use, and of course, the predicted indicators, the prediction outcome. So let's start first of all from the business question. It's very important to sit together with experts and understand the problem that they have. Uh, understand very well what is exactly the business question that they need to answer, which are the limitations in the current workflows that they have and in the processes that they are using, what is the nature to understand what is the nature of the problem to be solved. Then going to the data part, it's very important to answer questions about what data we need to use in order to answer these critical uh, questions, uh, how we can collect this kind of data, and usually the data collection and processing, uh, or if the data are scattered and heterogeneous costs a lot in terms of effort, so this is something that uh, you need to take into consideration when you are designing such a process, when you want to answer such uh, critical business question. And the, the other step is the prediction method, which are the right artificial intelligence methods that you will use to answer the critical question, to estimate the predictions, and also which are the metrics that you can use and what kind of metrics you need to use in order to assess the accuracy or the recall of such prediction methods. Next slide, please. So in our case, I will go to uh, the very specific uh, question that we hear from uh, food safety experts that we are working with, which is how could I predict which will be the food categories that will have more incidents within the next few months, within the next, within, within the following months. So in this case, since we have to do with incidents for specific product categories, we need to collect all the data for this specific, uh, for the incidents like border rejections and food recalls that are announced for the specific product categories. So I need to collect data from all around the world, from all the national authorities that are announcing recalls and border rejections for uh, product categories and for specific ingredients. And this is one part, a very serious part of data collection, data processing, uh, translation, and also enrichment. And then, you need to understand which is and you need to select the best uh, prediction method that can be used in order to predict the number of uh, incidents and since we want to predict the number of the incidents here we have to do with the time series prediction problem because we have the incidents that are uh, in different times uh, at different points in time uh, historical incidents uh, like food recalls and border rejections. So we need a very good method that can forecast the incident. And the outcome of uh, selecting the very good data set, a very good uh, prediction method, and also using very good uh, metrics to assess the accuracy of the, uh, of the prediction methods, will be the number of predicted food safety incidents for the following months. Next slide, please. So just to share a very simple example of the results, of how the results can be, can look like for such a specific questions like 
business question like for which ingredient categories recall and border rejections will increase. Uh, here we have the main, some of the main categories like nuts and nuts products, milk and milk products, fruits and vegetables. We have the first two columns uh, refer to the validation of the algorithms that we have done for previous years and how well they perform using an accuracy metric and what these algorithms have predicted for the next 12 months. And in this way, if we have such predictions for the different categories, it's very easy to understand, to identify which are the main categories for which we will have more incidents within the next, uh, the next 12 months. So we see here, for instance, that the incident seems likely to be increasing for nuts and nuts products within the next month, whereas we'll be decreasing for milk and milk products. So in this way, you can identify which are the categories that I will focus in terms of testing and other verification activities. Next slide, please. And then it comes a different question of how you put such a prediction method, how you, you will deliver such a prediction method in a way that will also deliver value to the expert. So in this case, to address something like this, we sat down with the expert, we understood the processes, the critical processes in this uh, identification, in the answer, in, in, the, to, in order to provide such an answer to the business question. And we identified that one very critical step is to check which are the ingredients for which we will have increased incidents. So to ensure that uh, the, verif the verification activities that I will use will focus on the right ingredients. The second step is to identify and predict which will be the hazards that will likely increase within the next few months to verify that your laboratory plan and audits include this kind of hazard. The next step will be to check which will be the increasing and emerging risks. So without any manual work, the value will be that you will be able to identify emerging and increasing risks. And finally, to know which are the suppliers and products that will be affected. So immediately you can activate the mitigation actions that you need uh, for these specific uh, products, ingredients, and suppliers. So based on this modeling, we developed and uh, we delivered a live Fudakai prediction dashboard that uh, will be presented by Michal later on, that models these four steps and delivers prediction in such a way that can also deliver value to the experts and answer a very critical question. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Janice, for the interesting talk. Um, I will immediately go over to uh, Nini we will talk about uh, how to design such a dashboard in an interactive and visually appealing uh, way. So Nini, Thank you, Roland. Track, if you want to share your slides uh, yourself? Yes, if I can. Uh, it says I need permission to do that. Um, Alina, oh, can you give Nini permission? Or if you stop sharing, I think I can share the screen here. Yes, so we will stop it. Nice. Hi, uh, so my name is Nini. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the uh, group of Katrin, and uh, a big chunk of my research has focused on building recommended systems, visualizations, and uh, mainly just trying to solve the, uh, the real world problems. So um, <clears throat> to begin my presentation, I want to start uh, talking about what prediction models are 
prediction models are to end users and how um, the trust on prediction outputs can change uh, depending on how we present the, the prediction results. So to give an example, let's have a look at this, uh, this diagram. So most prediction models appear to users as a black box. So we have, um, we have an input uh, <clears throat> and then there is something that happens in the black box and then there is an output. So this is how many people, many of us see the prediction models. Um, <clears throat> so then there is uh, a possibility that the output could change from what the user might expect. So when this happens, and the first thing they're going to ask is how did it happen and why? So the worst thing that can happen in this situation is that the user don't trust the system anymore or the predictions at all. Um, so what that means is they're not going to use the prediction system to make any important business decisions. Um, so trust in the systems, much like trust in user and in, in people, they're based on competence, benevolence, and integrity. <clears throat> so uh, what, what do we do? How can we uh, mitigate this kind of uh, issues? Uh, well, the first thing we can think of is to explain, simply explain the, the predictions. Why did, it, why did it happen and how did it happen? We could also think of involving end users in the uh, different steps of the uh, building, building the system. And, and finally, we can also visualize uncertainty and show, okay, here is the possible projection uh, that might land, uh, that the, 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 the output might land. Uh, these are the three aspects that we have looked at in our group. So I will talk each of these uh, in detail uh, in the next slides. So the first one, explaining the predictions. Um, so when we talk about trust, there are two types of trust. Uh, so the first one is trusting the prediction. That means that the users trust the individual prediction outputs sufficiently so that they can act, so that they can make decisions based on it. And the second one is trusting a model. And what that means is they trust the, the whole model uh, to behave to, to behave uh, in a way that they can predict. So it's, it's sort of a, uh, a predictable model, uh, that something that users can understand. So these two definitions are quite different and at the same time also related. Um, so they can both actually directly affect why, um, why users behave the way they behave when it comes to the prediction outputs and how they, um, how much they understand uh, the model's behavior. So there are some models that they, that can explain themselves. So for example, things like uh, decision tree, we have a uh, logistic regression that can explain themselves very well. So if we look at decision tree, for example, it's very easy to uh, extract the rules from the decision uh, tree. But there are also other models uh, from support for the machine to uh, neural networks that are very complex and very difficult to explain. So for these kind of mo uh, models, we can consider using uh, model agnostic methods. Uh, this is uh, something that I want to focus on in this part. So the first thing that I want to introduce is called LIME. Uh, <clears throat> so LIME is a method that we can use to explain how the outputs are related to um, how the output actually contribute to what is predicted. So in this figure here, we can see that there is a model that predicts that the patient has a flu. And Lyme says, okay, sneeze and headache had a positive contribution to uh, the prediction of flu. But on the other hand, no fatigue actually had a negative contribution to the flu. So based on this kind of explanation, the, the, the doctor can actually uh, make informed decisions. Um, <clears throat> there is also another method uh, called SHEP. Uh, so this was uh, very recently introduced as well. So the difference between LIME and SHEP is LIME seems to be a bit faster when we use in, in all practical sense. And um, SHEP is uh, a little bit slower. 
but uh, I, I'm not going to go into much detail because I don't have much time. So I will uh, skip to the next part uh, about uh, involving end users. So uh, this has its roots in the, the, uh, the uh, user in center design uh, when it comes to uh, building a user center machine learning models. So in the user center design, we include end users from the very beginning to the uh, end until the project is launched. So this is something Giannis has also highlighted uh, in his, in his uh, presentation, how important it is for us to include uh, the end user in different stages of the uh, development process. Uh, we can do something similar in machine learning, of course. Uh, the first stage that we might consider involving end user is in the feature selection process. So we have built this interface, uh, we call it uh, Gagovic, for, uh, it's a short for gap correlation visualization. Um, so on the left hand side, we can see the, the target variable, so the outputs, and on the right hand side, we can see the features, so these are the input variables. And what it shows is the bars are indicating the correlation of these, uh, the, the correlation strength of these uh, output variables with the input variables. So the longer the bars are, the higher the correlation strength is. And then on the right hand side, we can also see the correlation between each of the features uh, that we want to consider. So the shade actually highlights the strength of the correlation between them. Um, so what this interface tells us is that, but there are two things that we can learn from this interface. So the first one is um, we can identify the features that have very little to no uh, contribution at all to the prediction outputs. So, and the second one is uh, if there are actually feature pairs that are contributing very similarly to the output, we can try and select the feature that the user can understand the most. So this is the purpose of this interface. And then I will also show the next interface that we designed, which is in the next step, uh, model selection. So we call this interface Ahmos because uh, that's a short for augmented by human model selection. It's a bit uh, <laughs> something in the mouth to pronounce, but, but uh, in, the, in the middle of the, in the set, at the center of the uh, interface, we can see that the, the contribution of the different uh, features to the output of the model are uh, visualized. So the output in this case is the uh, grape quality, as we can see on the uh, y axis. And the, um, the x axis are the different features of the, uh, the, the grape uh, variables. So uh, these values are calculated with the Shep uh, library that I've mentioned earlier. So the, there is also a green box that you can see that are laid on top of these dots. What this represents is the green box represents the knowledge of a human expert. A, a, um, so it could, the, the experts in this case could be a viticulture expert. So this represents the knowledge of how the experts expect each of these variables to uh, behave for each, uh, for, the, uh, for the prediction of grape quality. So when we lay, overlay these two on top of each other, what the model expects and what the uh, human experts expect, when they overlay them on top of each other, we can see the, the agreement, the disagreement between the, the, the expert and the model. So this allows us to actually diagnose two things. So the first thing we can do is we can diagnose the data itself, is the data that we have good enough for, for making predictions. And the, we can also diagnose the models. As you can see, we have, we are showing here two models on top of each other. And we can select, we can do this for several different models at the same time. And we can see across all these different models. So the second thing that you can do is the, is the diagnosing of the model itself. So which of the model actually agrees with the, <coughs> with the expert the most? And can we actually select their model to make prediction for this kind of data? 
So moving on to visualizing uncertainty. Uh, this is a, a, a very nice visualization of uh, Hurricane Trek uh, uh, that I took from um, <clears throat> New York Times. So this is a this is showing the Hurricane uh, Irene here uh, from 2011. So we can see that as the time uh, as the pro uh, prediction is projected forward, we can see that the the boundaries actually get wider and wider, showing that there is some uncertainty in the, uh, in the predictions. So if you look at the right-hand side of the figure, we can see that uh, you know, the path is projected to hit New Jersey, but people from as far as uh, Baltimore, Washington DC might need to be prepared for the emergency uh, uh, things. So we, we have built something uh, as well to visualize uncertainty. So this is, uh, this is the, uh, the, the paper where we try to compare different ways of visualizing uncertainty. Uh, so we, as we can see, we have three different types here. And as it turns out, the, the one on the top left, so this one here, uh, came out as one of the uh, best performing ones. So but because of that, we actually continue and started working on a similar um, uh, visualization, but this time we focus on price prediction. So this is something that we collaborated with Agrino to try and build a system where we can predict price for the future, and then we can also visualize the uh, uncertain, uncertainty in the prediction. Um, <clears throat> And of course, how the how the how there is a variation between uh, the price that 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 could that might happen in the future. Okay, okay. so uh, there are a, a, a few visualization tools that you can use to actually do the visualization. So the 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 the, the very famous one that we we've, we've used is uh, D three. Uh, we also use uh, Vega. Vega is also well compared to D three. Vega is a high level approach. So it's also quite uh, interesting if you're starting out. We also have Plotly, which is also available for different languages. Uh, we also have Chart.js, which uh, is very nice actually, uh, but it doesn't allow you to uh, customize quite a, quite a lot. Um, so I'm running out of time and to end my talk, I'm, I'm just going to briefly uh, give you this uh, 10, general principle on design interaction designs by jacob nelson uh, if you have time please go and check out that website it's it's very very nice it's not a specific visualization so it's not a specific usability uh instructions but there are sort of more broad uh, guideline and principle for interaction design very interesting stuff and uh i with that i want to conclude my presentation thank you very much Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nini. Um, I would also would like to remind the audience, please feel free to ask any question you like uh, in the chat, uh, then we can gather them and uh, also save them for the Q&A. Uh, but before we go to the Q&A, then we finally have uh, Michalis, who will give us a demo of the uh, Fudakai Food Risk Prediction Dashboard. And Nini, if you can uh, stop sharing screen, then uh, Michalis can also share her screen for the demo. Thank you very much. Perfect. I so hello everyone. I am Michalis, and before I start presenting myself, Robin Quick could on pronouncing my last name. You did perfect there. So I am Michalis. I'm a data engineer and team leader here at Agrino. I've actually been involved with uh, providing data powered solutions to a variety of sectors, varying from financial and the media. And over the past uh, five years, I've been doing this for the food safety one. But enough with this, hopefully you can see my screen for, for now, from now. And from now on, let's move into a parallel universe where I'm no longer a data engineer, then food safety expert. And in my line of work, I deal with the various ingredients. Let's see how I can make and get actionable decisions based on the prediction dashboard that we've built in our platform, namely Foodakai. Now in my line of work, I deal with many ingredients. 
I deal with rice, I deal with sesame seeds, it's a mess out there, ginger, almonds, peanuts, and figs. Now, I want to utilize historical data, historical open data available out there, and I want to take advantage of this data, utilize this fancy tech, machine learning and deep learning algorithms that Jan described. I want to utilize visualization techniques that Neil described. And I want to make this all into actionable decisions. How can I get a quick overview over all of the ingredients of my interest? Which, are, which ones are the ones that I should pay more attention to over the next 12 years? And this is the first block that we have in our, in our dashboard. Over a quick overview, we have all of the ingredients that are of interest to me, which of them are going to increase in terms of total number of incidents over the next 12 months. You can see them highlighted in red here. And which ones are the ones that will have a decrease in terms of total number of incidents. And this is by taking into account the historical data available out there. Just a quick note before we dive into the specifics of the prediction dashboard. Kudakai has been collecting, has collected data going back 40 years. So what we attempt to do here is that we make use of all of this data in order to provide with actionable insights over the next 12 months. So we use this data and we attempt to go into the future 12 months and say what will most probably happen. Okay, let's focus now on the peanuts case. I have selected the peanuts and I want to know what is what will be the distribution of cases based on the historical data over the next 12 months and this is something that is visible here on the chart on the right i know what has happened over the past 40 years this is the green line here but based on that on our algorithms on our most accurate model can i have a quick preview a quick overview as far as the total number of incidents on a monthly basis are concerned for the next 12 months and this is the yellow dotted line that you will see throughout this prediction dashboard. And this is based on our most accurate uh, models. So, okay, I have a quick view as far as the overall distribution in, on a monthly basis concerned. But what about an, a quick overview, a quick ag aggregation as far as the total number of incidents? This is why we have this block here on the left. We know that for peanuts, over the past 12 months, Fudagai has collected data originating from 50 different data sources throughout the world. And these cases amass to a, a total number of 95 incidents. Okay, we know this, we have access to this, we also know the past 40 years of data. Can we do this? Can we implement this into a machine learning model that will attempt to predict in the future? And if so, with some accuracy. What, do our best, what does our best model believe will take place in the next 12 months? And this is the number here. Next year's incidents, 132. And this may not mean a thing. However, we have a sharp increase. We have a sharp increase in terms of tendency. And of course, this is by taking into account that you all know better than me that over the past year we have this pandemic. And this pandemic has affected various aspects of our lives. Among them are also the food safety checks performed by national authorities throughout the world. However, what we can is that by having, by taking into account historical data, we can also make accurate predictions that, okay, we have an outlier year. The past 12 months have been an outlier year in terms of data science. However, by taking into account all of this uh, historical data, we can limit the effect of this outlier year and perform accurate predictions. And our best model believes that there will be an increase of, four, of roughly 40% in terms of total number of incidents for peanuts. However, this quick overview does not yet uh, make us able to move from being reactive to actually being proactive. And in order to do this, we have to dive in deeper. And this is why we have to dive in deeper into the specific dangers, the specific hazards, and the specific cases that will take place over the next months, over the next 12 months, both in terms of risk and, of course, in terms of a uh, specific hazard. Okay, so what about specific hazards? Why will the, the total number of incidents for peanuts increase? And this is why we have this table here. 
we think we here dives in deeper into this, into the initial overall analysis that we performed, and attempts to dive in deeper into the specific hazards that will take place for the ingredient that we've chosen over the next 12 months. And as you can see here, the prevalent danger, the prevalent hazard for peanuts will of course be mycotoxin that will increase roughly 30%. And more specifically, the highest contributing one will be aflatoxin that will increase in terms of, uh, as far as percentages go, 37%. And the same goes for pesticides and so on. But, okay, what about the risk? Can we perform a risk assessment at all? We have access, we mentioned that we have access to many years of data. Can we perform a risk assessment? And the quick answer is, of course, yes. And you can see here on the blog on the right, with activated tab, the actual one, this is the current state, the current snapshot for the risk assessment as far as peanuts are concerned, which is the prevalent hazard, of course, mycotoxin, aflatoxin, and followed by salmonella and so on. And this is based on the historical data. But we just mentioned that we performed predictions going over, over the next 12 months. So the main question here would be, can we use this data? Can we make sense of this data and utilize them in order to perform a risk assessment in the future? And of course, the answer is yes. You can see it here in the tab that says predicted. And this is actually a snapshot of the risk assessment, of the same risk assessment, the same algorithm running. However, 12 months in the future. And you can see here that, okay, mycotoxin has increased a bit, aflatoxin again, but you do not see salmonella, you see absence of health certificates and pesticides and so on. So you see a somehow different point of view, different view, of course, moving over to 12 months in the future. But, okay, we have identified so far that mycotoxin will be the, the prevalent hazard for peanuts. Can we be a bit more specific? Can we actually dive in deeper? And as a food safety expert working in a food company, can I, I make decisions on uh, specifically which months, when should I be on alert as far as this risk is concerned, the mycotoxin risk is concerned? And again, yes. And you can see it here on this chart on the left. This again is by taking into advantage all of this historical data, all of these predictions that we've made so far, and the evolution of risk, the, the live evolution of risk can be visualized here. Again, in the green line, we have the risk evolution throughout the years that Futuka has been collecting data. But now we know what will happen in the future. Now we know what will most probably happen in the future. So can we utilize this data in order to assess, to perform a risk assessment over the next months? And if so, can we also perform a quick analysis and uh, alert the end user, uh, alert our users as to when should they be more on alert. And this is the reason for this red bar here. As far as uh, our predictions are concerned, we believe that 10 months in the future from now, the sharpest increase in terms of risk will take place. Okay, but what we've done so far, we've analyzed the product ingredient, the product term, in terms of total number of ingredients, risk, and so on. But this is not all for a food company. Food companies are producing uh, finished products, finished specific product recipes that contains various ingredients. And this is something that is offered by Fudakai among his capabilities. One can input his product recipes, his or her product recipes, and perform some kind of risk assessment. And this is what is visualized in this tab here. Among all of the product recipes that I have inputted as far as the customization of Fudakai is concerned. I have read the chocolate bar here, for instance, that contains peanuts, uh, cocoa, butter, and so on. And I'm right now analyzing the peanuts product. Which of my finished product recipes will most probably be affected that contain this ingredient? And the good answer is the chocolate bar. Why, uh, what is the danger, the reason, the hazard behind this reason to be on high alert? And it's the pesticides, and it most probably is due to the cocoa presence in the product recipe I have inputted here. And what is the specific risk that is involved with this? 
So, okay, so far we've analyzed an ingredient, we've analyzed the finished product. However, in my line of work and my food company, I'm mostly importing from specific countries, from specific continents. I'm getting ingredients from India, for instance. Can I use this information? Can I make some kind of predictions on a country or continent level? Again, the quick answer is yes, and you can see it at this chart on the bottom. Now, this chart is generated based on the historical data again that we have at our availability for all the food safety cases that originate from India. I'm interested in India, but of course, I may be interested in a, on a continent level. I, I could have Asia here or uh, North America and so on. And similarly to what we did uh, over at the top, is that we've made the same analysis. Okay, we know all this data. We have a line chart. We have a time series data. Can we feed this into a prediction model that will attempt to go 12 months into the future? And the quick answer again is yes. You can see it here. Similarly to what we've done throughout this dashboard, over the green line, you see the predictions, uh, you see the historical data available in Fudakai and how, my, how many cases do we know originating from India and what are most accurate models believe will take place over the next 12 months. And finally, enough with this. So far, we've focused on a product, on a country or on a finished uh, product recipe point of view. But We've also talked about the highest contributing hazard. And the highest contributing hazard is mycotoxin. What about mycotoxin as far as the rest of the food safety sector is concerned? What is, can, can we utilize this highest contributing hazard, mycotoxin, in order to assess its footprint as far as the total, the overall view for food safety is concerned? And again, this is why we have this blog on the left. Now, in this blog, what we've done is that, okay, we know that mycotoxin is the highest scoring hazard for peanuts, but mycotoxin is a food safety hazard. It will also affect other ingredients throughout the food safety sector. And here we've identified the top five of them, the top five of them that will be mostly, that will mostly be affected over the next 12 months. And scoring highest, we have dry figs coming up next, figs, and you can see the risk assessment here. And this is why we have this specific block. And now, this concludes this part of the presentation. However, before I close up, let me mention that if any of the information available here sounds interesting and you want to give it a go for your specific supply chain, bear in mind that what we just experienced was actually tailored made to specific customization I've made. So if it sounds interesting or you just want to give it a go in order to identify specific emerging hazards for your supply chain, please, please feel, free, feel free to let us know. There will be a link in the QR code later on where we can book a specific demo and go over your specific cases, your specific ingredients, visualize the results and attempt to perform some kind of actionable outcomes coming out of it. Thank you very much for your attention. I will stop sharing my screen now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michal. So I will quickly share my screen again. Um, so like Michal also mentioned, if you're interested in a demo, you can uh, of course uh, just contact uh, Michal as well. You can also use the QR code or the link to register uh, for the demo. So now we have some time for uh, Q&A. We haven't seen that many questions yet in the chat. However, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, post them. I can maybe kickstart the session with the uh, first question. Um, that, um, let me see, uh, what impact, uh, maybe it's targeted to everybody, so maybe everybody can comment a bit on it. What impact do you believe that predictive analytics are having on the food supply chain? I don't know if you have any volunteers to start uh, with an answer. Can I, yeah, Nikos? Uh, this is a very interesting question because I, I think that uh, we are looking at two different uh, dimensions, uh, time dimensions or two different universes. Yeah? 
One has to do with what is happening in real time within my system. So I have the control points, I'm measuring data in real time within my plants, within my facilities and my supply uh, lines. And then I can utilize the power of the algorithms trying to predict very quickly if something is going to come up before it does come up. And then there is another uh, universe, and this is, I think, the, the universe that we are uh, presenting that is looking outside the system of a particular organization, of a particular manufacturer uh, or retailer, and that is looking at the rest of the world at a more macro, let's say, scale, trying to get the signals of things that have already happened, dig inside these signals and try to understand if we can predict something about the macro level. I think we are looking at a tremendous impact in the way that people are taking decisions, both at both levels, at both universes. Okay. That's actually excellent, Nikos. And if I may build on what you just said, I what we visualized using a uh, guy's dashboard, uh, or the visualization techniques, or the machine learning methods that Yanis and Mimi described, is actually something that takes into account the open data out there. Now, just an open question out there. Imagine this being fed with the vast amount, the vast volume of internal data available in food companies out there. I, mean, I, I believe that just a quick, uh, my quick point of view on the answer, the impact will be amazingly huge. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in the meantime, I see that we also have a question from the audience, a question from uh, Catherine, so thank you very much. Um, the question is, to what extent do you take into account that food processing methods or risk detection methods have evolved over the past decades when processing historical data? I may provide my views on that and, uh, of course, uh, the other speakers can uh, complement as well. So, <clears throat> that's an excellent question. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, right now we don't have uh, a factor that normalizes these differences in and this uh, evolution in the food processing and uh, uh, detection methods uh, what we are uh, in, in one of the cases that we are working uh, in uh, with uh, one uh, company from the food industry uh, we had added also a factor uh, about uh, the detection methods, about how um, easy uh, is to identify such risks uh, with the current detection methods, with the current detection technologies. So the answer is that it is possible to include such a factor into the risk estimation, into the risk assessment model that will also take um, into account uh, the feasibility of identifying very important problems in the supply chain, hazards in the supply chain. And this factor uh, can be different, uh, it, can, it, can be, it can change during the years uh, based on the evolution of the technology. So by adding such a factor, it could be, uh, we could also take into account uh, this kind of evolution. And uh, Robin, if I'm also add a little bit to what Yanis is saying, um, this is exactly why we believe that uh, predictive analytics for food safety uh, is not just a numerical exercise where we take numbers of incidents, we put them in a model, and they generate a number. This is why we, we really believe that the devil in the details is hidden inside the question that we want to answer. And then there is a trade-off that starts in a very nice way that also uh, Katrin mentioned, 
there is a trade-off that starts even from the negotiation around the assumptions that we have to make when we frame the question, the right question, so that we can then choose the right data, incorporate the dimensions that are important that we are, want to look for, and agree on the indicators that we believe are potential signals of a higher risk. So this is a process, an uh, iterative interactive process, and uh, it takes time and effort, and it requires human feedback and intelligence to make sense. Otherwise, it's just an exercise, uh, an academic exercise. So that's why uh, I really believe that the process, the method, is uh, a very essential piece of the whole solution. Okay, I see that in the meantime, uh, more questions are coming in. Um, so the next one is from uh, Ilias, and he asked, uh, what about the cost of data mining and hypothesis analysis? How far can we go in, can we go in agro universe? Excellent question. If I may take the rest, uh, the first draft in this. I, now, because we've been dealing with food safety data over the past five years, let me tell you that it's not the most, uh, let's say, data savvy world out there. There is, there is vast amounts of data, many different sources, many different languages. We're talking here about the official food safety authorities throughout the world. and. Each of them are announcing data in their own internal format, in their own national language. This is really a challenge. So as far as uh, the other number, the, the actual cost, of course, it's uh, quite a big one. However, it is what we do in terms of food agri. What we do is that we collect this data. We've come across different languages. Chinese and uh, PDFs are, are an actual case out there. But also are the languages, Indian, uh, different formats, XLS, XML, and so on and so on. We can dive into the details uh, deeply. So yeah, it's a challenge. And it's not only this, you also have to automatically categorize this data to enrich, as Janis mentioned. Because you, the, the raw data doesn't make any sense if you're not harmonizing with some kind of internal vocabularies. You need to know what kind of ingredients, what kind of products which was the company, the date of the caller, body rejected. So, real, a quick question here. Yeah, it involves a cost. Yeah, we've been doing this over the past five years. It's a challenge, it's a huge challenge out there. But as far as the second part of your question, Elias, goes, how far can we go? I believe we can go quite far. The food recalls and border rejections are not the only data available out there. We have counter indicators. We have weather data that affect these agricultural commodities. We have price data. We have lab data monitoring results from official sources. And as Nikos mentioned in uh, the first question, we also have internal data. Internal data available in companies. Food companies are performing their own lab tests. And this is a, a huge volume of information available. So my quick answer to your second part of the question, how far can we go, is that really, really far. And I believe we just scraped the top here. What would visualize? Robin, if I may also add to that, um, especially for the how far we can go, but uh, in the when we apply artificial intelligence and this kind of predictive prediction approaches, it's very important to take into account uh, that we have some trade offs. So the data collection, the processing can be costly. But if we decide that we are more interested in speed and not or recall and not so much on the accuracy, then you may go up to the point that the accuracy with collecting the data up to the point when the accuracy is uh, quite okay for you to take a good decision. You can continue working on the data. You can you can collecting data, but the added value may be not so big. So it's a process, it's an interactive process. 
uh, where uh, we need to work with the experts that uh, they need the answer to these critical questions and understand which is the trade-off of accuracy and uh, data collection. And if I may do the connection with uh, the next question that I, I read from Jeff, because uh, Yanis uh, is mentioning something that gives a, a connection. I, I want to use an example, huh? uh, the example of uh, food adulteration incidents, food fraud incidents. If we look at the number of food fraud incidents uh, historically in a particular uh, product category or ingredient category, I would say, let's say, paprika, it says something. And then suddenly we may see a spike and if we try to do the predictions based only on the number of incidents in paprika, we may predict something that is wrong. Eh? The algorithm may predict something that is wrong. This is where the expert knowledge, the root cause analysis, comes to play and says, you know something, around the time there was an increase in paprika prices, in particular in the countries that are producing paprika. And we saw it and we knew that adulteration incidents are going to also increase. Then this is what we do in the equation. We go back to the data and we say, okay, what if we include in the model the analysis of prices of paprika and we try to rebuild the model, a new model, a new version of the model that will predict something also taking into account this data signal. And then another expert will come and say, okay, but you know something, there is another event, another signal that we have to incorporate in the model. And then again, we go back to the data. And so it goes. Just to add, uh what Nikos is uh, saying for the question of uh, Jeff. Uh, for the problems that we have in the food industry, for sure we cannot have uh, a fully automated approach where the machines are taking the decisions. They are so complex, these problems, that we need to integrate the knowledge of the experts in, a, in the way that Nikos is describing. So this is uh, this is a, a, a process that it needs uh, collaboration, and uh, by uh, understanding which are the main factors and dimensions that we need to include, it is possible to uh, to integrate all this knowledge, uh, but still we need constantly to be in contact with the experts in order to understand uh, and integrate this knowledge into the uh, prediction systems. So it, it, it's not a, a game that is played only on the side of uh, the technology and the people that are building the technology. It's like a tango. It needs two. Thank you very much uh, for going into that as well. Um, in the meantime, we received a related question, um, maybe more geared towards the academic side. Um, how do, with all the involvement of the experts, how can we enhance the trust of the experts in these prediction services? Um, yeah, I think it's a very interesting question and it's somewhat related to what uh, Nikos and Skianis has said. So we, try to focus on how we can bring the experts together. And we also try to find a way to show this. So how can we show the experts that there is a problem uh, in the data? Or how can we let them diagnose that there is a problem? There is a problem with the data. There's a problem with the model. This is also why we focus on these uh, sort of visualizations as well. Uh, it, when it comes to trust, I think uh, the you know, the, as I highlighted earlier, the explanations themselves are quite, uh, of course, important. And the, the, the uncertainty visualization also seems to be quite uh, important as well. So these are the two important things that I would add on top of what uh, 
Nikos and Yanis has already added, so including the experts themselves already into uh, the, the process of machine learning. Uh, but of course, we also need to be able to highlight where the problem really is and allow them to actually steer or control the model uh, if needed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I see that there is another question just appeared uh, from Jeff. Um, and then maybe first one, uh, Nini and uh, Katrina, yeah, Nini's not muted. Um, how do UX requirements change in the mobile world where screens are smaller and visualizations need to be more specific and crisp? So, of course, this is also an excellent question. In the mobile world, indeed, the, the screen space is much smaller. Um, so, visualizations even need to be much more simple, uh, condensed. Uh, and again, I think the user centered design process here is key to come up then with representations uh, that, that also work on mobile devices. Okay. Um, maybe. Because I see that the comment from Jeff was mainly uh, positive feedback to everybody, so thank you for that. Um, maybe a last question, if no other questions are coming in. Which are the main difficulties and challenges in finding all the data that you need to build all these predictions? Maybe, yeah, uh, maybe everybody can briefly comment on it because it's a general question and of course there are many difficulties, so it's definitely interesting to hear everybody's uh, Viewpoint on that. Is everyone okay if I take the first go here? Yes. yes it, there was the buzzword data here, so I had to pop in. I know. I, yeah, so the main challenge, I would say, as far as official sources and official announcements are concerned, from a data engineer point of view, again, I would say identifying these sources. Uh, given the language barriers out there, the availability of the web, internet connections, firewalls, and all of this tech stuff that are out there, I, at least from a data engineer point of view, the most difficult part is actually identifying which is the official food safety authority in China. Where can we get Excel or PDFs in the Chinese language? If we get this, we can make sense of them. We can translate them, we can enrich them, but where are they located? And the same goes for other countries throughout the world. And just a quick uh, point here, mostly an open question. The whole continent of Africa is a somewhat black box for us as far as information is concerned, and information announcement is concerned. We've been looking at this, but however, uh, we do not have access or there are no, no official announcements so far. So as far as the data engineer is concerned, I would say the identification of the sources, the, the hugest challenge out there. I know that Yanis wants to, to say something, but if I may complete, complement what Michal is just saying, because uh, he's focusing on the public sector data part. And uh, there, I think that there will always be uh, political or economic reasons for which we will still have some data silos. Uh, this is not something that we can uh, avoid. Uh, there will be a reason or many reasons why uh, an official authority will not open ac up access to all the data that it is uh, collecting, managing, and uh, using for decision-making on a national level. I think that the, the challenge there and the question there is, can we build uh, for a subset that can be shared, something like uh, the Google Maps of food safety data that everyone can rely upon and use. So can we build this public sector data infrastructure that will make this information available to everyone as a common resource? So that at least there is a minimum set of data that everyone can access and use. I think if this is possible and when this becomes possible, because I, I really hope that we can uh, go there, we will have made 
a, a tremendous step forward. I would like only to add uh, two more dimensions to the difficulties and challenges that uh, Michalis mentioned, uh, but also the vision that uh, Nikos uh, shared with us, that uh, one of the main issues is that still in the food industry, the, the part of the data that follow standards and that can be interconnected is very small. So we have many different data sets that are totally disconnected and that may be relevant and to refer to the same thing. So it's very important, and this is one, uh, one challenge, and the solution to that could be the adoption of, of uh, standards. One standard, for instance, that uh, we all know is the, the barcode for the product brands uh, or the GLN for the companies. Uh, because especially in the case of the company, you know how many variations we have in the names of the companies and how uh, complex is the structure of the companies. They have parent organizations, subsidiaries, uh, they have uh, organizations and, and how dynamic this is. This is changing constantly. So this is one, uh, one a very important challenge and uh, having interoperability and uh, between the different data sets will open new possibilities in the way that we can use the data. And the other part is, of course, there are still concerns about the security, the privacy of the data, so the industry is reluctant. And there, are, uh, there is very important progress during the last years uh, for anonymization of data, for protection of data, uh, and still we need to, to apply and to show how, how this can work uh, and to be the trust also to the industry that uh, if this data, uh, that this data can be shared in a very secure way and this data can be used to predict very important things, very important events in the global supply chain. Thank you very much. Um, maybe with that, I will briefly share the final slide uh, again. So I do want to thank everybody for participating in today's call. Um, I think it was very interesting. We also learned a lot, also very interesting talks for everybody. So thank you very much for that. And before you go away, I would first like to ask uh, both Nicole and Katrin to maybe give some closing words so that we can wrap up uh, this session. Thank you very much. Okay, also thank you very much from my side. It was a great pleasure for me to be able to uh, present some of our work, the challenges that we're addressing. Uh, for us, it is a very interesting domain to work in. We've been doing uh, very interesting collaborations also with Agrono in this uh, domain. And we're very keen to expand on the work. So if you're interested in potential collaborations, of course, feel free to, uh, to uh, contact us. Uh, we're very much interested in expanding uh, this work in this domain. So thanks again for attending. Uh, um, thank you. I, I also want to focus on the collaboration part uh, that we wanted to highlight uh, in this uh, webinar. It was not about presenting the way that we solve in our company uh, such problems, but we wanted to highlight the wealth of scientific problems and computer science related problems that exist when we are trying to solve such an important societal challenge, preventing people from getting ill from food. It comes back to uh, essential research questions that we can pose to excellent teams like uh, the team at uh, K11. And this can pave the way and provide a, a very rich environment to work together in solving additional problems so i hope that to an extent we we, we managed to share the the complexity of uh, the problems at hand as well as how we believe that they can become real practical uh, solutions and uh, steps
thanks to everyone that presented and to everyone that has attended. Before you go away, um, maybe final administrative uh, mention that the recording will be uh, put online and sent to everybody early next week. So uh, thank you very much again.